give and you have any questions, uh, please feel free to drop them in the uh, chat or if you're watching on Facebook in the comments there, producer Gus will push them along as we proceed through the show. Uh, today, like I mentioned, we have Aaron Skinner on. Aaron, I'm going to read all the acronyms uh, at, at the end of your name. Uh, and if you can just give us a brief uh, intro about yourself, and <laughs> I'll get into uh, kind of what we're going to talk about. So uh, you're a registered dietitian nutritionist, certified personal trainer, certified leap therapist, and then I see uh, IFNCP and MS there as well. So can you just give us a little bit of a background about yourself before we get into today's topics? Sure. So I'm a registered dietitian specializing in integrative and functional nutrition and also in sports nutrition as well. I have really two practices where I work. I work at the corporate headquarters for Adventist Health in a functional medicine clinic serving them. And then I also have my own practice mm -hmm. um, where I serve, you know, people who want support across a broad range of nutritional related challenges. Um, so those are my top things. I've, I'm just enrolled now in a doctorate in clinical nutrition program. So that's my new venture. Awesome. It's staying uh, busy, I imagine. Always. Not, not letting the, uh, any amount of free time, uh, not, not letting any of that, uh, you know, kind of be too free. Um, yeah. be <laughs> before we uh, dive into things, uh, we had another dietitian on the show previously. Can you tell us what a registered dietitian nutritionist is and what that specifically is? Sure. So registered dietitians are the only nutrition professionals who hold an actual healthcare license. And mm -hmm. so we have to um, get at least a bachelor's degree and now it's changed to master's degree mm -hmm. um, in nutrition. And then we have to do um, a 1200 hour internship that takes about a year in clinical nutrition across a broad range of topics. And then we have to take a board exam. So mm -hmm. it's much more than just like a one week nutrition class that if you want if you do something like that you could call yourself a nutritionist but not a dietitian right so the difference between dietitians is we can bill insurance we are healthcare providers um we work in a broad range of medical settings mm -hmm. as well and then um the difference why it's called registered dietitian nutritionist though is there is um just professionally there was some confusion where like dietitians are feeling like they weren't considered nutritionists because the word nutritionist isn't in there right so it's the same thing as registered dietitian, and they have this weird thing where you can pick which title you want. Do you want to mm -hmm. be an RD or an RDN? And they're the exact same thing. It's just, do you want the word nutritionist in your title? Right. That's something, yeah, at the very top, I like to kind of clear that up in case yeah. people are, you know, saying, oh, well, my, my friend is a nutritionist, but, you know, they didn't go to school for years and years and do hours and hours of, uh, you know, yeah. practice and stuff like that. Yeah. That word's just not legally protected at all. Anybody can really use that word, whereas yeah. dietitian, you can be like legally prosecuted, I guess, if you falsely claim to be right. a dietitian. But right. just one little thing. Minor point, though, is I, there are a lot of really great nutritionists out there. Mm -hmm. And so I I just don't like that kind of attitude that I'll sometimes see with dietitians where it's like, oh, we're the only real nutritionists. Right. There are some great nutritionists who aren't dietitians. There's um, a specifically a credential called the CNS that's, mm -hmm. I feel like, equivalent to ours in mm -hmm. most ways. So mm -hmm. um, I think if you're getting someone who's not a dietitian, just be careful to vet their background and their experience and their training just to make sure you're getting someone who's giving you safe information. Right. Especially now in an age where maybe we're interacting more with people through a virtual environment and yeah. it might be important to pay attention to expertise and, and, and titles there. Yeah. Um, I want to give an intro about what we're going to talk about today uh, and specifically uh, an area like we we like having people on who are experts and an expert like yourself. We're going to dive into some of these topics. Um, last week we talked about uh, a couple different energy systems, and it might seem confusing yeah. to people that uh -huh. consider running. You know, putting on your shoes, uh, you know, tying them up and going out the door. So today yeah. we're going to talk about fueling specifically in the context of keeping in mind some different types of energy systems, what you should be mm. focusing on specifically uh, for different types of intensity. A lot of yeah. runners are stuck at home and now you have time to experiment with new fueling techniques and diets yeah. to improve your performance. Maybe we'll talk about some angles they should experiment with, especially if you know we're gonna have a huge fall racing season, you wanna practice that ahead of time. And oh, yeah. then 
um, if there are any supplements runners should focus on for performance related or endurance related uh, benefits. So um, yeah. number one, the first topic is fueling your energy system. So like I mentioned last week, we talked about, uh, you know, at least on the stride side, we have this mm -hmm. uh, model that can analyze your workouts, then we can identify the differences between some really short high intensity, some medium length, medium intensity, and then longer duration, a little bit less intensity. Yeah. How should a runner maybe not even getting into like the textbook definition of, you know, a lactic <laughs> glycolysis, all this stuff. Like it's helpful. Come to know. on. No, so, so, biochem. <laughs> yes. So, so, so I, I would love to hear your input on this, but then also maybe a way that a runner could practically absorb some of this knowledge and be able to yeah. internalize it. And maybe when the time comes in the future, they can go to a group run and start to tell people, Hey, you know, I listened to this great podcast or watch this great webinar. How sure. can people, keep in mind that running is a complex biochemical interaction in, in their body practically. Right. <laughs> well, I, I love this question. I won't get, I promise I won't get too deep in the weeds on the, the bug, but there are three different ways that our bodies produce energy for running or cycling or exercise in general. One of them is very short duration, so like zero to 30 seconds. The other one is more like 30 seconds to two or three minutes range. And then the other one is three minutes and beyond. And I think the mistake some people make when they know this is of thinking, well, oh, if I'm going to exercise for more than two minutes, I just need to worry about the, the third of those. Whereas what we see when we research running is that runners will actually be using all three of these pathways across their workout. Um, and then obviously in different proportions, depending on what type of workout or race it is, but there are different ways to fuel for each. And so it is wise to really consider ways you can fuel the different types of, of energy production rather than just, I think the traditional way I'll see endurance athletes fuel is really focused on only that third one. So you're really just kind of missing some, some edge that you could get there with your nutrition if you're not adequately fueling for the other two energy pathways. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to get into specific ways? Please, please. And then maybe, okay. uh, yeah, break down in a scientific definition. So people maybe understand why there's a difference and why, um, you know, there are certain types of general time cutoffs between the yeah. types of energy systems we're referring sure. to. Okay, so I'll start with the first one. Well, yeah, I'll start with the first one. So like the shortest one is the creatine phosphate pathway. I think you call it the lactate pathway where you're basically taking creatine and rapidly recycling it to produce energy by basically just decoupling and coupling um, uh, molecules on and off of it. And so when you think about doing like a, a six reps of a bench press or if you think about a sprint, you're mostly using that. Um, energy pathway. And so what's really critical there is to have enough creatine available. So eating that, that comes from really animal protein predominantly, or obviously you can take it as a supplement. And that's a really, you know, there's a lot of research showing that creatine supplementation does benefit runners. And so that's just a nice way that it underscores that, hey, even if you're not a sprinter, you still need this pathway, right? Um, so cre having enough creatine available is important. And then that adding and subtracting of molecules, that's called methylation. And so um, to have your methylation pathways running well is really critical. There are a lot of genetic differences among people with respect to how well they methylate. And so it's really critical to be ensuring that you have sufficient quantities of the nutrients needed for those pathways. It's You can't assume that you do it well just naturally without being intentional about it. Um, the main things I'll focus on with methylation are B vitamins that are um, pre-methylated. So methylfolate, methyl B12 are the most important. And then choline and glycine are two molecules that um, support that pathway by basically like holding the reserve methyl groups, then adding and subtracting them. And so choline comes predominantly from eggs. Glycine comes actually from eating like nose to tail, like bone broth, collagen, or, you know, if you cook down either some like bones like with collagen in them, or if you just take collagen peptides, like from anywhere like Costco has like a good brand of collagen peptides, you can get around the whole bone broth thing if you don't like that. But getting enough glycine in your diet is not always easy. There's not a lot of it in muscle 
um, proteins like chicken breast and things like that. So that's another area where I'll have people focus for the creatine phosphate pathway. Um, you want to talk on the next one? Yeah, I had one uh, maybe quick interjection uh, sure. here. So we talked about uh, creatine. It was maybe last week. I, I, I think it was. These are all blending together now because we've yeah. been having so many great people on. Um, one thing I know when people search around specifically for creatine supplementation for runners is that it can cause some weight gain in the form of water retention yeah. and people kind of mm -hmm. seem immediately off put to the fact that taking um you know kind of like a, a powdered supplement could make them you know suddenly gain uh what people describe as horror stories of a bunch of weight <sighs> do maybe talk to why sure. it, it might be important to consider adding in creatine even if there are, um is a potential a small potential why there might be some water weight gain and why it's actually maybe important that that you have that water weight gain yeah, I mean, I think bottom line, so a couple questions here. When you, the more creatine you have, it, it does accompany water. So you will have more water uh, on board when you have more creatine on board. If you have an excess amount of creatine, now you're working against yourself, though, because you didn't get all that extra water and you didn't, so following an appropriate dosing regimen is important, but at the, at the end of the day, the studies show that it benefits runners and it always will accompany excess water. So the, it's what's relatively a small amount of water retention that you get with it in a normal setting is not enough to take away from the beneficial effects that you'd get from having it. Totally. Um, that's one thing that, you know, yeah. uh, if I see any of these trends, I like to kind of, you know, research them for myself. And that's always the the first question that pops yeah. up fr from runners specifically, and maybe cyclists as well. Any yeah. activity where it's, you know, very, uh, you know, additional weight gain sensitive uh, yeah. for overall performance. Yeah. I mean, this is definitely something to not try, like when you're in the middle of your competition season. Mm -hmm. I, I always have people get it on board, like, during the preseason training season, see how they feel on it. You know, you can go on and off of it. It does, there is a loading period and then a maintenance period. So you don't go on and off of it like from day to day, but you can try it for a couple of weeks, go off of it and then try it for a couple of weeks. Most people will then be, have a good idea of whether or not they feel like it benefits them. Awesome. Yeah. I think that insight is uh, super helpful. Yeah. Uh, do you want to move on to the next energy system that we're talking about? Sure. Yeah. So the aerobic or excuse me, the anaerobic pathway is that moderate phase where you're from around 30 seconds to around two to three minutes. And so this is a way your body can get some energy very quickly without the use of oxygen, but it's not for each molecule of glucose, which is the substrate for the second and third ones, you get a lot less energy, but it's, again, quick without oxygen. So if you're going to, in a race, imagine you're trying to pass somebody or you're in your final minutes wanting to sprint to the finish, you're, you're certainly switching over into this aerobic pathway. So it would be a mistake to not make this a priority as well. What you're basically doing here is you're taking those glucose molecules, you're breaking them into something called pyruvate, and then pyruvate, you get the ATP, which is the energy to contract your muscles, but you also get lactate. And so lactate is what builds up as lactic acid and it causes that muscle burn where you just can't go anymore when your muscles are hurting. So um, things you can do to support there are, first of all, the glucose is coming from your glycogen store. So just as with aerobic exercise, but I feel like even more so with aerobic, you need to make sure you have adequate glycogen stores. You are using methylation again to support this pathway. So all the things we talked about before with methylation are really important. Um, and then there's that, some other nutrients like um, zinc and um, magnesium that come into play here. So I recommend getting enough of those from like nuts and seeds getting your B vitamins from at least five servings of vegetables a day, focusing on dark leafy greens. That's where you get your folate. And then B12 only comes from animal sources. So either animal protein or a supplement. Yeah, I think that's um, super interesting. And a lot of people probably have heard these terms that we're talking about, but they've never taken the time to sit down and educate themselves or have somebody who knows all about this, tell them about it. Um, yeah. 
The one kind of consideration that I might ask you to talk about here is as we're between talking about the anaerobic and the aerobic side, can you mm -hmm. talk about how, um, you know, for, for these two systems, they're never really exactly 100% like anaerobic and then immediately switch to 100% right. aerobic. Like you always right. have that contribution from yes. your anaerobic side, like you mentioned, your your lactate threshold that people yeah. should probably be really familiar with that yeah. feeling of yeah, your legs burning. You know when you cross that side, like that side of the threshold, but yeah. you always have that contribution from the anaerobic side, even if you're running for an hour plus steady state or you're racing a half marathon or a 5K. Could you talk yeah. maybe before we get to the aerobic side how the body actually kind of switches and has these different types of contribution? Sure. Yeah. I mean, within like a minute of exercise, your body is starting to ramp up the third one. We haven't talked about this, the aerobic pathway, but it really is just a really long and complex pathway. So it just takes really quite a bit of time for your body to really get to its maximum capacity on the aerobic pathway. So meanwhile, you're still demanding your legs to move, right? And so your body is filling in that gap of time with these other pathways. Well, it's basically like up, like like a computer. I think of the way a computer like is booting up. You wait for it. Maybe you need to like send a quick email and you can't wait. Maybe you get on your iPhone to send that email really quickly before your computer is really ready. But you, your computer is much more powerful perhaps for something like a spreadsheet is maybe an example. So across the first really 20 minutes of exercise, your body is still ramping up that third aerobic pathway and then filling in, as you said, uh, the gaps with the anaerobic and a little bit of the lactate pathway. That's actually probably the most interesting description and helpful description I've ever heard for different <laughs> energy systems. If you want to send the quickest possible text, you get on your Apple Watch or yeah. you boot up your iPhone for that, you know, kind of midway. And then you want to, yeah, get it, get on your MacBook or something for yeah. the really, you know, real the business. I, yeah, the real business. <laughs> That's actually super interesting. Um, yeah. We could probably put that on a t-shirt. Uh, that would be go. very, very good. Um, maybe the one other thing uh, I'd like you to maybe touch on is that when people hear the term uh, lactate, lactic acid, blood lactate, they kind of get scared because a lot of people consider this a, a sort of negative thing. But in fact, there's a lot of research showing in just general, um, you know, kind of pathways within the body showing that like lactate can actually be used positively in the body. And it's actually a positive contribution. Can you talk um, people maybe down from uh, an edge of saying, oh, I don't want to do anything regarding blood lactate because I'm only a marathoner and I, I don't oh, want to take I this see. into consideration at all. Yeah. I mean, so the lactate threshold that you mentioned is is trainable, not infinitely, but it is trainable. So if you can push yourself to your limits with respect to your lactate threshold, meaning you do some short bursts of intense exercise to where you get to burn out and you can't go any farther, you're you're over time increasing your tolerance and increasing your threshold for the amount of lactate that you can build up before you have to stop or slow down. So then how that would translate to say a race would be maybe you decide you're a quarter mile from the finish and you want to start sprinting. Maybe if you hadn't trained your lactate threshold, you wouldn't be able to sprint that far. But maybe it, when you had trained your lactate threshold, you can really keep up a higher pace for that final quarter mile. Awesome. Yeah. Uh Great way to visualize it, I think. Uh, can you touch on the last uh, energy system that we have listed here? Yeah, so this is the one that everybody really thinks of. But again, we need all three. But um, the aerobic energy production pathway is basically where you're taking glucose, you're putting it through the Krebs cycle and electron transport chain and really breaking it down to produce the maximum possible amount of ATP or energy from that glucose. And so where you get that, well, so you start off, this is another way that things transition over the course of like, I know most of your people are endurance athletes, right? So I, I kind of hate the what they put on treadmills where it's like, oh, you're in carb burning mode or you're in fat burning mode. That's not really the true way that it works. You're, you're predominantly using carbohydrate for this anaerobic pathway initially. It's gonna be the blood sugar that you had 
And that's going to be refueled by the glycogen that you have stored. And then over, like, just picture it kind of like a gradual, like, decline of one line and an increase of another line. As that glycogen becomes depleted, you're burning more and more fat for energy. So over time, you're starting to break down stored fat, put it into um, pyruvate, and then down the same aerobic pathway. And so you are using stored fat, but it's a gradual transition where over time you use more and more fat and less and less carbohydrate as you do it. Yeah, totally. Um, I want to touch on the next point that we had here in this topic. And I um, have seen we've had a, a lot of questions uh, trickle in, and we'll get to those after this first topic um, and remind people that if they do have any questions, uh, please drop them in the uh, chat and they'll be sent our way. Um, so we've specifically broken down and kind of defined these things that people should keep in mind. And now let's yeah. loop in the nutrition side sure. of it. So for a long-term basis for sustained performance, what should you think about incorporating in a diet and why might some of these different points be important to yeah. have in a well-rounded diet to support the type of sure. uh, you know energy systems that we've been talking about? Sure. So I we maybe maybe make a special thing on this. I'm seeing a ton of questions about plant-based runners and I work with a lot of vegans and vegetarians. So yes. we should probably get into that. But, um, but more broadly, first thing to get in order is what are called your macronutrients. So how much carbohydrate do you have and the timing of that? <laughs> how much protein do you have and the timing of that? And then how much fat? And then when you put all that together, that's your total energy intake for your day, right? Protein, fat, carb equals your energy intake. So, um, well, plus any alcohol you have, but... That shouldn't be a major sort of part of it. Right. So, <laughs> seven, seven, seven kilocalories per gram, though, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's the thing to keep into. Uh, in, we'll in see if that's not a huge piece of the pie. Right, right, uh, right. So just getting that in order is really the first step. And the reason why I say that is I'll see a lot of amateur runners who are way off on those. But then they'll be looking towards like really fancy supplements and things to try to get an edge. And it's like... If you don't have the foundation laid out with getting the right macronutrients in your diet, no fancy supplement is going to overcome that. So that's really the first thing to start measuring that. If you're not, know where, what you're doing with macros. Start to understand more about like the timing of those macros around your exercise and start to get that dialed in. Um, and then the next thing I would say, like if you picture a pyramid, that's kind of like the foundation. The next tier on the pyramid would be quality. So making sure you're getting um, those macronutrients from nutrient dense foods that are going to also carry in the vitamins and the minerals that you need to perform, as well as these sort of what I call phytonutrients, which are compounds in plants that are not a vitamin or a mineral, but that still are really important for not just our sports performance, but just our health in general. So, you know, getting enough plants, enough quality proteins, um, nuts and seeds, healthy fats, instead of just eating junk, you know. And then the next tier that I would look at is now look at specifically at your micros. So before we're talking about macros, then look at you, your micros, what vitamins and minerals and essential fatty acids are you getting or are you lacking? Where can you improve there either with diet or supplementing? And then the next tier, I would say, would be more like edgy supplements. So once you have those first three tiers in place, now you can start to think about um, like a more fancy supplement that you might have heard about or read about. I think the what it, the phrase is like, take care of the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves or something like that. So you have to take care of the most important things, right? That that big, well, well-rounded yeah. diet and everything. Um, I want to yeah. jump into some of these uh, questions because, yeah, we've had a ton uh, trickle on. Yeah. It seems like uh, the two times now that we've done the nutrition side, people love asking questions because I feel like, especially for runners, <laughs> it's the <laughs> thing that's always on the forefront um, of their mind is the, the yeah. nutrition side too. Um, yeah. so the first one here is from Daniel, and Daniel says, uh, just from the, the first part, I uh, uh, touching on a lot of meat related stuff are vegan people out of luck here <laughs> and this is specifically uh, i i think i'd maybe preface by saying the stuff you were talking about is from a basic biochem 
break yeah. down how how those sort of chemicals interact with the body. But are vegan yeah. people out of luck here, Erin? Yeah. So I have I work with a lot of vegan patients, and I have the really it's such a privilege. I am able to run these really comprehensive nutrient panels on my patients, where we can see literally what their status is for every vitamin and mineral fatty acid and exactly what's happening. Um, so I have a really good idea of what happens with like a vegan um, person versus a vegetarian versus an omnivore on a standard American junk diet versus like a healthy diet. I can almost predict at this point what these tests are going to look like. Um, I wouldn't say that a vegan is out of luck at all, but I would say that there are certain things that are really important for sports performance that are very difficult to get on a vegan diet. And so, um, you know, supplementation is generally key as well as just like a laser focus on tracking intake and focusing on specific parts of the diet that can really be the most powerful from a vegan diet. So to see a vegan wasting a lot of calories on nutrient poor foods like bread and pastas is, is, is unfortunate. And that just even increases the nutri the sup the need for supplementation in that case. Yeah, no, uh, great answer. Uh, I do have a message here from producer Gus, and he says we've had a ton of questions rolling so far and we'll get to the questions. Um, but can you plug any of your social media or your website because you do have uh, links just as a lot of people are watching right yeah. now. We maybe want to give uh, some more info to people watching. Sure. So my website is just aaronskinner.com. So www.aaronskinner.com. And there's links to all my social on there. The Instagram is aaronskinner underscore RD is where I'm most active on social. And there's a contact page on my website. And my, pod my podcast is also linked up on my website. So that's probably the best place to go. And you mentioned your podcast is called... Yeah, it's called the Empowered Nutrition Podcast. Awesome, super. Uh, so I wanna to touch on a few more questions then we'll uh, move on to the next uh, set of questions that we had. Uh, yeah. Pascal asks, uh, is creatine supplementation not associated with renal problems? What dosing would you recommend yeah. or time as in, is there a max time of subsequent usage? Sure, so creatine supplementation has been shown across, I mean, it's the most studied ergonomic aid in in the world. So there's a ton of research on creatine. It's extremely safe and benign. Unless you have known renal problems, then you should definitely work with a healthcare professional on it. But for someone with normal renal function to take creatine is not dangerous. But it's just important to stick to like a few safety guidelines. So first of all, make sure you get one that's um, GMP, good manufacturers for sport so that you know that it's not has anything in there that you're not looking for. You know, it's just creatine and nothing else. <laughs> um, and then um, the other safety thing I'll have people do is follow a loading period as long as I feel like they're safe and appropriate for this. So I'll have them take um, five grams four times a day for a week. And then once they're, you have your stores up where you want them, I'll just have them maintain at five grams a day. So it's important to just not suddenly take 20 grams or 30 grams or 40 grams like that. Awesome. Uh, Bradley asks, uh, well, says first, hello from Kansas. Uh, can you please touch on a plant-based athlete in the correlation with optimum performance? I do Ironman triathlon and recent Ironman world championship winners were plant-based. So um, again, the question was, please touch on the plant-based athlete and the correlation with optimum performance. I don't I don't know that you could say that the top athletes in the world are all plant-based or I'm not sure if that's what he's saying, I, but I think it can be done well. It mm -hmm. just is important for that person to be you know supplementing appropriately. There's no there's no plant-based source of the vitamin B12 for example. Mm -hmm. So, right. um choline you can't really get from plants. Mm -hmm. It's really tough to get the right proportion of amino acids and enough protein from plants. And so it's just so critical for them to be really intentional about their right. regimen. But if you are, you know, if you're really just on your nutrition game, then there's no reason why they can't perform right. just as well as anyone else. I'd, uh, I'd also probably say the people that are in the position to win Ironman world championships have probably 
you know, set up the rest of their whole athletic career to be, you know, successful. So they're trying to take care of all, all the edges yeah. too. So oh yeah, for um, sure. Plant based might not be the cause, but if they're doing something from a plant based side, they're probably yeah. looking at all aspects like you're recommending. Sure. Yeah. Um, Ian asks, can you talk about keto or keto diets yeah. and how they affect the three systems? Because if you're not in taking the same, uh, you know, type of diet, if you're on a keto uh, um, type diet, how does that affect these three systems at all? Yeah, I, I love that question so much. So um, I, I love ketogenic diets for a number of reasons. And they've been very well studied in athletes, especially recently as ketogenic diets have become more popular. And there was a very famous, um, I don't know if you all know this already, but there's a very famous thing that happened where the I guess someone for the Lakers, I don't know who it was, decided they were going to all go on a ketogenic diet. And they just had like the worst series of games in history. They didn't, they did really poorly on a ketogenic diet. So that's just one example of overall, I feel like the research really shows that you're not going to be at your absolute peak athletic performance on a ketogenic diet. In the vast majority of cases, there could obviously be an outlier for something, but I just think knowing the biochemistry, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to perform at the same level. If you have any chance of doing your best on a ketogenic diet, competitively, I think it's going to be at more of an endurance type of activity because the t first two pathways we talked about, the creatine phosphate and the anaerobic pathway, um, really, it's hard to feed ketones into those. And the first one, you literally can't. And so it's really only the aerobic pathway where you're going to be able to use ketones in any appreciable way. All of that being said, though, here's my little thing that I know you're asking about things that people could experiment right now leading into the fall. So when I used to live in Boulder, Colorado, we I was in a grad school working with distance runners. You know, the thing is, and you all know about this, you, they, you would like train high and compete low with respect to altitude, right? So you're conditioning yourself to, to train, to run at low oxygen. And then when you get down to lower altitude, there's so much oxygen, you can just, you're a beast, right? The same thing can be true with carbohydrate. Um, so I have people do the same thing where they'll train on a low carbohydrate diet for one to two weeks during their training season. That will then entrain your fat metabolism and increase the enzymes and the the cellular mechanisms that are important for that what's um that fat oxidation or using fat for energy and then as we said previously when you're in endurance aerobic exercise you are especially over time using a lot of fat oxidation or fat for fuel and when you've got those mechanisms upregulated and entrained from your periods of training on low carb it can really give it a competitive edge but i don't mean people should compete on low carb i just mean train on low carb just for some period of time and then eat carbs but you're going to still perform probably better and this is something too that uh is still being researched, still being studied, yeah. still being implemented in a you know wide wide aspect right now too. So um, maybe ten years from now we could have a totally different answer, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But but yeah, for for right now I think that's a great answer. Um, I want to get to some more of these questions later. Uh, we yeah. have a set topic list just to make sure we keep the uh, train rolling um, sure. here. So maybe. So we, we had a couple more points that I think are actually super important before we get to the uh, topic two. For somebody going out and doing a, a run, let's just uh -huh. say um, they're going to do a type of workout focused on, you know, maybe they're doing hill sprints and then maybe yeah. they're doing, uh, you know, some anaerobic threshold repeats and then maybe they're going to go do a long sustained steady state uh -huh. run. How should somebody be eating immediately before each of these workouts or maybe the time, yeah. a couple hours leading up to these types of workouts? Yeah. So I really have refined my protocols with this over just years and years of working with athletes. And what I found to be best is, so here's a common mistake that I think some athletes make is thinking that like the food you eat like right before you work out is going to 
change something for you. It, all three of these pathways really depend on food that's already gone through your stomach, through your small intestine, been absorbed and like put into blood sugar at a minimum. So that takes at least 30 minutes for that to start happening. So I'm like no, no food for 30 minutes at least before any workout is going to help you. It's going to actually probably harm you because you're now taking blood away from your muscles and shunting it to, towards your digestive tract to break down that food. So 30 minutes out, no food. Um, some water obviously is fine. And then if someone wants to have food 30 minutes out, it's going to be half a gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight no, and carb only, no fat, no protein, because those are just slower digesting and they slow down the carbohydrate digestion. So really for, to get it done in 30 minutes, it has to just be pure carb. And then if they would like to do farther out, an hour and a half is when I'll have them do one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. And then maybe just up to like six, maybe 10 grams of protein and very little fat in that sort of snack meal. And then what's really like the best for endurance exercise is really like the three hour out meal that has um, at least around one and a half to two grams of carbohydrate per kilogram plus enough protein that you would have in a normal meal and then like some fat in that meal. Some people can pull that off two and a half hours out, but like I find that three hours is generally the ideal. And that type of fueling has really been shown to give the best like PRs for like half marathon and, and longer events. So that's what I'll generally recommend. But if you, um, you know, again, if you, if you don't feel comfortable not, not eating anything for three hours out, you can do the one and a half hour I feel like for um, if you're going to be doing like hill sprints or something that's very anaerobic like that, I wouldn't advise the 30 minute um, meal or the 30 minute snack because it's just not even fully digested at that point. But if you're on a more like aerobic, gentle type of exercise, it's usually just not that impactful. But if you're really going for it with with a run like that, then I would say at least an hour and a half out to do that. For the yeah, for that really high intensity, yeah. probably the potential positives are very outweighed by the potential negatives of just things not being digested and just yeah having that um, counteracting your performance for sure. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I it's, think that's a great point, and everybody yeah. probably can relate to that too. If you're like, oh, I'm really hungry, I need to snack on something really quick before my workout. Yeah, then they know probably, how they feel afterwards. Yeah, that's probably just nerves, and you know, aside from that, like carbohydrate in those three options. Mm -hmm. The rest of the things you need for that workout are the nutrients, the vitamins, the minerals, the proteins that you're really getting for the days and weeks prior. So right. the nutrition for that workout is predominantly already happened the right. <laughs> days before. So, right. um, you know, if, unless you, unless you already have everything else dialed in, mm -hmm. I wouldn't solely focus on just the pre-workout meal. Mm -hmm. Let's um, I maybe want to give one uh, kind of practical, uh, practical sort of example before we move on to the next topic. Let's say I do my Saturday or Sunday mm -hmm. long run and I, you know, do it at 7 a.m. because mm -hmm. I have to do some other stuff um, on Sundays or Saturdays. Would you recommend waking up at four and eating a full meal or, you know, kind of pushing it back? How would you maybe recommend if there are some constraints that yeah. people can put on there? What's maybe a, yeah. a mindset or mentality that people should be able to recognize that they don't have to stick to these exact, yeah. exact things. Maybe they can kind of play it, play it by ear. Yeah. So. Super common scenario. And I mean, the most important thing is, you know, if you're training for a competition and you know what the timing of that competition is going to be, you want to be practicing with different fueling techniques exactly the way you're going to compete. You shouldn't be trying out new things that day. But it's very common to have early morning runs where you just didn't have that three hours or even the hour and a half. So I'll just have people do the 30 minutes. Some people can eat a banana out the door, a piece of toast or something out the door and be fine. And if that's you, that's totally fine. But um, I wouldn't advise trying that for the first time on a race day for sure. Nothing new on race day. Um, yeah. You, you heard it here first. Uh, <laughs> well, probably yeah. for the millionth time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I want to move on to the topic number two, and then we'll get questions at the end of that. And then this will be 
Um, the last reminder that we'll give if anybody has uh, any questions, please feel free to send them in and we will touch them after uh, this topic. So this topic you briefly touched on uh, already and it's experimentation for performance. Okay. So this sort of line of thinking is maybe trying to focus a little bit down the road as we, you know, fingers crossed, hopefully return to a regularly scheduled racing season. Uh, how might people be able to focus on experimenting with different types of nutrition or fueling strategies to get the most performance possible for them now that they have more time to experiment? Sure. So um, just to kind of flesh out the one, the one thing we already talked about, for people that are going to play around with adapting their, their fat oxidation pathways, I won't have them go to what would be a classic, really like ketogenic diet during this time because that's a fairly, it's a moderate protein diet, but much lower than where I keep athletes with respect to protein. So what I'll have them do is stay at least like 1.4 grams per kilogram of protein each day and then just within like 100 grams of carbs. So that's well above ketogenic levels of carbs, but well below what an endurance athlete should be getting. So I'll have them do that for ideally two weeks if there's time, but even one week can be beneficial. And then the fat will just fill in the, the rest of the caloric needs. And then um, have them just proceed through their training um, while doing that. And people, you know, I'll, I'll work with them, but they'll generally feel pretty good doing that. And then um, aside from that, play around with you know, maybe now's the time to try out some new things that maybe you haven't with respect to, first of all, what we talked about with the pyramid, tracking your macros. I saw a great question about post-workout fueling, making sure you have that in order. We can talk about what I recommend there. Play around with those pre-workout um, fueling techniques where you're intentional about like how many grams of carbohydrate and everything else that you're getting at what specific time. And then if you've got that all in order, maybe play around with like caffeine is probably the most well-proven ergonomic aid and then you could play around like we said with creatine things like beet juice or powdered beets cherry juice things like that um there's just a lot of different ways you could go and so now is maybe yeah so maybe you would say yes now is the time that people could probably yeah. experiment and, and yeah. try some stuff for sure um yeah, yeah let's dive into the questions because i i feel like you know these could all be topics themselves, right? All, yeah. all the great questions that people are um, sending in. So Grant says, I know this is a bit of a tangent, but I've been training to be a Navy SEAL. Uh, and he says his biggest struggle is a consistently good diet. Mm. Any advice on diet if I'm doing two a day training? So this is huh. something that people might actually have uh, a, a lot of experience with right now is if they find themselves working from home or have a lot more free time, they've yeah. maybe been enticed into the concept of doing two a days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say that two a days would prevent you from having a good diet. I'm not sure what he means by not having it. Although I will say a lot of people right now are struggling with, they were previously depending on a lot of prepared food. And so they're just struggling a little bit with the quality of their diet when suddenly it's all on you and your cooking skills to make it happen. And people are hesitant to shop as much. So there, there are a lot of people struggling there with, with currently the situation around their diet, or there's just the classic thing where there's a lot of their social activities, there's going out to eat, there's drinking with friends, like that's mm -hmm. always just a temptation that exists. And so um, for the short term, what I'm recommending right now is, um, I wish I could invite you guys to. I'm doing a free meal planning seminar for a group. But the whole point of that is that when you meal plan for your week and prepare and plan a shopping list and then bulk cook. So like mm. don't mess around with making two servings of food. Like what a waste of time is that? You know, even if you live alone, you should be making at least eight servings of food every time you cook and then freeze what you don't think you can eat before it goes bad. So you mm. and freeze it in individual servings. So you mm. can discuss meals you can pull out. Every meal should be protein, fat, carb, you know, make sure you're getting those macro balanced meals. It can be simple. It can just mm -hmm. be, you know, those individual components, um, batch cooking, huge sheets of vegetables, huge 
you know, sheets of sweet potatoes, whatever your thing is, don't mess mm -hmm. around with making like a little bit at a time, mm -hmm. get a crock pot or an Instapot, make big batches. Um, and just start to, you know, meal planning really helps with that. Otherwise mm -hmm. it's kind of like, well, I don't know what in my house would make a meal. So I guess I'll just have a bowl of cereal and you know, it all goes downhill from there. So, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, so that's one thing for right now that I'm recommending. And then, um, with respect to the, just, you know, everyday life sort of temptations that happen around diet, the top thing I can recommend for people is not even a nutrition tip. It's just something I've found over the years to be the most helpful. And what it basically is, is that, um, and I don't want to get to like, tell me if you feel like, sure, sure, sure. Too, like something for you. But I have a lot of people do this where you have a goal, mm -hmm. you know, imagine your race, imagine what time you want to get or what place you want to get. Every day I'll have people spend like when they first wake up and then like midday, I'll mm -hmm. have them like close their eyes and picture mm -hmm. it happening. And it'll be like the smells of what it smells like, the sounds of what it sounds like, the things that people say, what, what it feels like when they get the medal or the award or right. whatever whatever it is for you, what your, you know, what your family, like envision seeing your family and friends at the finish line or whatever mm -hmm. it is, right? When you do that, something really amazing happens in your mind where like subconsciously you churn on that and it becomes in your mind almost like it's already happened. Mm -hmm. And then when you have that moment in that evening where like the cake is put out or whatever, mm -hmm the natural consequence is that you don't eat the thing that isn't consistent with what in your mind has already happened. Right. It just keeps it where like it's, you're in the zone. You're, right. it's, you know, it's, you're, you've got like the eye of the tiger with it. Whereas if it's right. just a kind of like vague thing you rarely think about, well, the cake's there, you're going to eat it. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, visualizing, sometimes I'll have people do affirmations where mm. they'll like repeat to themselves. I'll have them put like post-it notes on their mirror and say mm. in the bathroom in the morning, like, I am the first place finisher for my age group at mm -hmm. this half marathon on this day or whatever it is, or I am whatever your goal is. Um, so I'll have them do that. A vision board is really great. You know, mm -hmm. you put a board out with like pictures that inspire you like related to your goal and work on that. So whatever drives you, some people will journal about this. It's kind of personality dependent what works well for you, but mm -hmm. um, my, I guess my top mm -hmm. nutritional tip isn't even nutrition, it's mindset of just getting locked in on, you know, if it's to be a Navy SEAL, I, I'm a second career dietitian. I used to be a military performance officer and I would mm -hmm. work with Navy SEALs all the time actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they have to be extremely serious about their work and focused on it, right? Even like in the off season when they're not on a mission, they have to right. be focused on maintaining their performance. So if you kind of picture that, like, in his example, like imagine that you're a Navy SEAL, imagine that you're needing to perform. That's going to help to like really focus your totally. efforts. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. No, that's great. All encompassing answer. We uh, talked to a uh, sports psychologist yesterday about the same sort of thing of that visualization. Yeah. Oh, how yeah. how nice. powerful that is. Yeah, um, it is. So it's very, very helpful. Um, next question here is from John and he, he uh, it's talking specifically about your your website, uh, and we'll give you a chance to plug that before we wrap up yeah. um, here. Uh, Aaron's website says, no bro science here. I use the science-based methods that work best for women. Does this mean you don't accept male clients? And this question's from oh, John. Oh, I do accept male clients, and I mm -hmm. love working with male clients. Bro, by bro science, I mean where you're just kind of saying what works for you and not basing sure. it on evidence. I try to stay very close. I'm a long-term science writer. I'm constantly reading the research. Right. And I only pr talk about what's proven by science. And my web, so I, like I told you, I work in two practices. Mm -hmm. My website is more women specific, but over mm -hmm. the years I've, I've worked with many male clients. My practice used to be you know, targeted to both genders. And then mm -hmm. at my practice, Adventist Health, I work with both genders. Awesome. Awesome. So definitely very experienced. But the uh, main point of that is being rooted in science and not totally. necessarily just what, you know, your friend might tell you, um, yes. you know, on, on a group run or yeah, something. Yeah, like, like a that. game of telephone. Like I use this and I sure. use this. I use this. Sure, yeah. sure. And then it gets all twisted and convoluted. Uh, yep. Patrick here says, Next to a strong genetic component for slow VO2 max component, mm. how could diet 
help gearing up the body more quickly. So I guess this is uh, potentially referring to how a diet could help the body. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm maybe struggling to get the message across of a strong oh, genetic component it. for, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so if, if you're talking about pushing, so like VO2 max is different than gearing up quickly. So that's kind of an interesting question. VO2 max being like your maximum ability of how much oxygen can you uptake and metabolize for any energy production. So there is a genetic component to that, but the biggest thing is entrainment. So one mistake I'll see a lot with amateur endurance athletes is, is just jogging <laughs> all the time. And, you know, VO2 max is like a muscle. If you don't ever push it with VO2 max, it doesn't change. You really got it. Like we were talking about earlier with lactate threshold training, tempo runs, hill runs, you've got to get some of that maximal effort exercise in order to really increase your VO2 max. So, um, hopefully that helps. And then he's talking about diet to help the gear, body gear up more quickly. That's really what we were talking about earlier around like getting enough. I would say I have my athletes at least get five servings a day of vegetables to get all of the, the methylation, important vitamins and minerals from nuts and seeds are really important. Amino acids, again, the glycine so that you can run those energy production pathways efficiently. And, um, you know, staying again to like an anti-inflammatory, high quality diet, I find to be really helpful there as well. Yeah, awesome answer. Uh, Jim asks the next question saying, his daughter is a vegan and trying to get into running. What supplements or vitamins, if any, should she look at? So maybe uh, touching again on what you had talked about a little bit earlier about things to consider for a uh, vegan or plant-based diet. Sure. Yeah, I... I know you'd said maybe talk about just supplements in general for runners and some of those are like more critical for vegans than others. So do you want me to just kind of run down the list and then I'll. Yeah. I'll I think that's great. Great place to put this part. All right. Let's do it. I actually want to pull that because I don't want to forget any. So the one of them that I always like for people to take is a really good quality multi. And so one thing you'll notice is that if you go to like get a multivitamin, at just like target or Walmart or something like that. I don't know if you'll notice this or not, but it's missing a lot of nutrients there. And then they use the poor quality versions of a lot of things. So they won't use like methylfolate. They'll use folic acid, for example, in, in supplements like that. And so um, I'll generally shy away from that with somebody who's like really serious about their performance. I'll have them use a higher quality multi that can be split into multiple um, usually like a high quality one will be split into like two to four caps a day. So you can, take them across mm. the day and absorb more. But for vegans, I especially focus on that just because of, I just see so many nutrient deficiencies with vegans. So I'll, I'll get them on a good quality multivitamin. And then um, I've, I run omega-3 checks on my patients as well. I've never seen a vegan come back with healthy levels of omega-3 fats in my practice. I don't mean it's not possible. I've just never seen it. So I'm always going to get them on an omega-3 supplement. And just runners in general, I like to do that because it's anti-inflammatory. It helps with muscle contraction um, and it's, you know, an antioxidant. So I'll do that. Vitamin D is a known risk with um, endurance athletes. It's very demanding on your vitamin D stores to perform. So I think that's a common misperception. Like you think, oh, I'm running outside all the time. I, I should be fine on vitamin D. I don't generally find that to be the case. And there's good studies to show that correcting low vitamin D will improve athletic performance for sure. So I'm always looking to measure vitamin D levels and to supplement to get people's vitamin D um, in place. And, you know, aside from sunlight, it generally comes from like supplemented foods like milk, for example, is like the most common like food source of vitamin D. And so if you're vegan, obviously you're not having milk. So vitamin D is a supplement and it's more critical there. Um, collagen peptides. So um, this is tough for vegans. You can get collagen peptides through either bovine or um, or shellfish sources. So that's that's a really tough thing for them to get. But um, 
with vegans, to be honest, I'm usually just working on getting them up to enough protein to even just support their exercise. That can be like really tricky for them. A lot of them aren't even meeting their basic needs aside from exercise, let alone the increased needs of exercise. So I wouldn't stress too much about collagen. If you're vegan, I would just try to get your protein levels up to at least my goal usually for athletes is 1.5 grams per kilogram of body weight a day. So you if somebody, <laughs> if I can interject really quick here, yeah. uh, if somebody is uh, ascribing to the uh, like a vegan diet, mm -hmm. what might be a good uh, protein source for them? I know that there's yeah. um, talk of having things like pea and rice protein or a type of soy yeah. protein isolate or stuff. Maybe you yeah. could um, talk just a little bit about if somebody is yeah, sticking mm -hmm. to this plant based diet, where might be a good way for them to seek yeah. out high protein foods? Yeah, so we know that um, plants don't have the full complement of essential amino acids in them. And so it's important to get a variety of whole grains, legumes. Quinoa actually is probably the best source. But again, you can't just eat quinoa all the time. So getting a variety of sources is important. Nuts and seeds, again, are so nutrient rich. So that's the one place where, where I'll work with vegans. And then usually we're, again, looking, like you said, to a vegan protein powder. And I do like to get one that has a combination of different plants in it rather than like just a rice protein, for example. And then um, another big one is um, iron. You know, we know there's extremely high rate of risk of iron deficiency anemia with endurance exercise. Heme iron is much more highly and readily absorbable. Um, then non-heme iron. Heme iron only comes from animals. Non-heme iron comes from plants. So a vegan athlete is at increased risk of iron deficiency. So I'm usually looking to supplement with iron, especially with vegan athletes. A probiotic, we know that exercise induces intestinal permeability and that endurance athletes have higher risk of, of irritable bowel syndrome and digestive problems. So I'm generally across the board using a probiotic with most of my athletes and most of them find that to be helpful. I don't find that to be something as, as vegan specific though. Creatine we really talked about and then electrolytes, that's not a vegan specific thing, but a really important piece of the puzzle is, just, is to take electrolytes at appropriate timing. See if I missed anything here. Those are the big ones that I would say. So with vegans again, I find that, so like B12, I've, they've got to take B12 hands down. Often they've got to supplement with folate. Often I'll find them low on even things like magnesium. Zinc, zinc is tough to get from plants. It's only like 20% as absorbable as um, zinc that's from animal protein. And so zinc is really one thing that I'll often supplement with, with vegan athletes as well. And then just making sure that protein needs are like at the levels that they need to be from like a complement of different sources. Yeah, awesome. I think that's uh, probably the most thorough that we'll get in terms of uh, a, a listener question. It's <laughs> uh, you know, 100% into one of the topics we had listed. So um, great to yeah. get that in there. Uh, I think we have time for maybe two or three more quick questions. Uh, if anybody asks questions here that they uh, that we didn't have time to get to, um, again, we'll give Erin uh, one last chance before we wrap up uh, to give more info about her, you know, social media and website and stuff. And um, people can definitely learn uh, from you there. Uh, maybe touching here, a uh, question from Karen is thoughts on intermittent fasting and is it beneficial for long distance runners? So we talked about a keto diet. We talked about, um, you know, low carb versus high carb diets. What about intermittent fasting? Because it's not necessarily the same thing as no. either of those? It's not. Um, so I, I use intermittent fasting a lot with patients and it's really helpful with something called autophagy. So it's like a cell clean out that happens where there's an anti-aging, anti-cancer effect of that. And so I'm a fan of fasting. Fasting is great for fat loss. So if you're an athlete who is looking to decrease your percent body fat, I do like to use some fasted cardio in the mornings um, as a way to help achieve that. So that's that can be one helpful thing. Otherwise, I don't find it to be as helpful for that fat adaptation as just like it's just not a prolonged period enough of time. Like you, if you say you're fasted, like intermittent fasting and you're at the end of say a 16 hour fast, 
you still probably have enough glycogen to where like if you go run, you can use a lot of that without having to rely as much on um, fat oxidation. Whereas if you're on that one to two weeks of like lower carb diet with endurance training, you're going to really be getting into that fat oxidation pathway a lot more and then training those mechanisms. So like you said, I agree, it's not the same thing. It has kind of a different purpose. It's, I'm not against it. I wouldn't compete fasted um, unless you just know you've done that a lot in your training and you feel really good on it. Um, then, then it might be okay for you. But, um, you know, it also depends on how you define fasting. For me, I see the start of like a true fast to be like, it needs to be a total of 16 hours. So say, let's say you eat at like eight o'clock at night and you wake up and run at like 5 a.m. I wouldn't say you're really like, intermittent fasting at that point you just had a normal overnight fast totally and i guess that's uh one thing too and that's not the subject necessarily of this webinar but uh what is the definition uh yeah. in, in the definition of intermittent fasting too yeah. um i have one last question here and all the questions that people have asked are great uh and so i know um, i want to just we, we I, I think i think maybe what we could do is pass on any of the unanswered questions and if maybe you want to do a follow-up blog post on on our site as well to kind of direct back to your site that might be something that we can do um i want to ask one last question here from leo and he says what about post-workout meals for proper oh, recovery yeah, oh. so this is like we talked about yeah. the before talked about during and now let's wrap it all up with what people should keep into yeah. um, you know, mindset or consideration for a post-workout meal, a post-race meal, sure. just how to refuel that way. Yeah. So um, my rule of thumb is within 30 minutes, 30 grams of carbs, 10 grams of protein minimum. If you're a larger athlete, you'll probably want to possibly double that. So uh, the most common mistake I'll see with athletes or you've even seen it at the end of the race where it's like the banana and the bagel and the orange and like what's missing there, the protein, there's no protein in any of that. Uh, we know that when you're repleting those glycogen stores and repairing muscle, that 30, it really is up to 60 minutes, but 30 minutes is ideal. That period really depends on that protein to help get that carbohydrate where it needs to go in addition to the direct um, effect that the protein has on muscle repair. So um, it's important to plan for that protein because it can be harder to get than, you know, it's easy to just eat like, you know, a banana or something, which isn't even 30 grams of carbohydrate. So plan ahead. You know, m my biggest tip probably is just to get, a f if you don't already have it, get a free um, nutrition tracker app where you can put things in plan out what your post nutrition meal is going to be. And if it's not at 30 grams of carbs and 10 grams of protein, that's an easy win where you can probably start increasing your recovery and your performance by just hitting that each time. Awesome. Uh, I think that that's a great place to wrap things up. Uh, producer Gus says that he told the stream that uh, they can find you at your website or social. Do you want to plug yeah. that one more time before we wrap up? Yeah, it's just aaronskinner.com. That's the website and everything's linked there. Awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah, I definitely uh, appreciate you coming on. I think this is something that, you know, we obviously think we could talk about for four or five, six hours. I know. There's keep, so many good questions. Keep the questions coming. Uh, we'll we'll try and uh, maybe talk later about if we can relay the questions to you. But if people have sure. any questions, please feel free to reach out to Aaron. Uh, Aaron, I want to thank you again so much for coming on today. Yeah. Um, hope everybody's staying safe and healthy out there. Uh, yeah. For now, this was this episode of the Stride for the Love of Running series. Thanks again, Aaron, and we will be back with another episode soon. Bye -bye. Thanks for having me. Take care.